Um, but yeah, in terms of business and in terms of investing property, um, yeah, hard. don't fall in love with an investment property. That's just, that's a, that's a recipe for disaster. So yeah, um, go in with your mind yeah, over your heart. Hi, everyone. My name is Ramon Fayad, um, and you're listening to Property Investory. Fantastic. Well, Ramon, thank you so much for coming onto the show today. I'm actually really, really excited because I love having these interviews with property developers and to be able to share their stories. So firstly, maybe let's start off with sharing with the audience, just saying your full title, what you currently do in the business, and um, maybe talk a little bit about your history and feel free to brag about it as well too. No worries. Yeah, so I'm co-founder with my brother of Ellison Property. We're a development uh, company uh, based in Parramatta in Western Sydney. Um, background of mine is my family uh, have been in property their whole lives uh, through construction. My grandfather, his grandfather, going all the way back to our, uh, we're third generation now, but even uh, his father and his grandfather, they were all builders back in our uh, homeland of Lebanon. So in the 1800s, they were building schools and roads and all that. So it's been in our blood. It's been instilled in us. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it literally is in our blood and we've just grown grown into it from a, a very early age. Very now early. today, yeah, we've uh, me and my brother have created another um, company, we've set up another arm, uh, just more of a development arm. Um, yeah, looking for new, new, fresher ways to do things differently. Um, we, I mean, we wouldn't be in this position without our family, without our history, but it's got to a stage where we... Uh, you know, just want to do things differently, new 21st century kind of thing, you know, um, young, new, fresher approach. And yeah, using what we have learned in the past and through our family though. So Fantastic. Yeah. All right. Well, tell us a little bit more about, I guess, what you're currently doing on a day-to-day basis. Maybe say, yep. share with us, you know, what is it that you're heavily involved in at this point in time? Yep. So a day, so a day in the life of me. Um, so I'd be up at 5 a.m., uh, go to the gym first thing in the morning. That just gives, sets you off on that right path where you're achieving something, you're doing something, keeps the mind fresh, body feeling good. Uh, so with a personal trainer every morning at 6, 6.30 a.m. Um, straight after that, into the office at about 7.30, 8 o'clock, pick up the coffee, go through the news. So I always like to start the day reading what's going on in the world in the news, um, using all um, yeah, whether it's property, sport, everything, like just the whole, whole um, everything, um, you know, uh, big on sport. So sport's my, uh, my break from, from work, you could say. Um, yeah. And then, and then I get stuck into the day, which is meeting with the heads of each department, um, going over their reports, seeing where everything is. So it's not a physical, I get in and I check emails at a certain time. It's, it's more, we're creating a, company here where everyone's free to talk to each other walk around it's not you do this sit at your desk it's get up walk around go for a coffee to have a meeting you know just pick up don't have to always pick up the phone or are you available it's just walk into the office so there's not a real set structure everyone's doing their work but it's more about um yeah just um getting everyone involved a bit more so yeah i mean i'll oh my day is involving my stronger point which i have learned in the past was was in planning and acquisition so mm-hmm. I still do gravitate towards dealing a lot more with the real estate agents, dealing a lot with state government and local councils to get our approvals through. So that would take up most of my time still because it's just naturally the way it is. We've got the planning team, but at the end of the day, yeah, we need to, um, that's what I come back to. Um, and then, yeah, my brother, uh, Fayad, who's also the other co-founder, he grew up more in the construction side of it. So it was a good balance. So yeah, we've actually balanced out well, which is which has helped us, yeah, get to this um, and start this company. That's fantastic. Yeah. So basically you're you're the one who goes out, gets the deals. And yep. then your brother is the one who builds the deals. Yep. That's how it was. Yeah. So that's how it started back in the day. And that was that's with our so I think our father at a young age saw our kind of strong points and he he um uh, kind of yeah, so straight from school, my brother went out on site. Um, I went out on site, didn't like it as much. So my dad saw that and kind of put me in the office business management side of it. So it was good. Um, and yeah, it's it's worked out beautifully now. So we both have our strong points. We both still cross over, like I'll cross over in construction still, he'll cross over in acquisition, yeah. but you just have your strong points and we go to each other for advice and um, updates on where everything's at. That is awesome. Yeah, it's like the perfect don't. relationship. Yeah, we worked out well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. No, it's worked out well. Great. I, yeah. I can see that your father really helped and nurtured your your strengths, you know, and it's really amazing to be able to yeah. hear that. 
And I, I think this is actually a great lead into it, actually, to talk yep. a little bit about the family, talk about your growing up. So maybe let's take a step back and, and yep. look into your story and, and get to know you personally. So firstly, where did you grow up? Uh, Western Sydney, so area in Wentworthville, Constitution Hill, which is yep. now called, but yeah, Wentworthville, Parramatta, Western Sydney boy, born and raised, so born there, went to school there, yeah, and everything, so. Nice. Yep. I know Constitution Hill actually quite well, because I actually yep. have, own a property down in there as well, oh, too, well, so. Very good. Smart <laughs> man, you're a good investor then, you know the area, yeah? yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, you know. it's a good area. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's really interesting, because um, a lot of people who I know who are developers actually focus around this area, and there must be something special about it. I guess, what what was it like when you grew up? What was school like? You know, tell us yeah, something about we, that. So, again, I mean, I've literally in the 32 years of my life, I've been in, not a bubble, but everything has been Western Sydney. Like I was born in Westmead Hospital. I grew up in Constitution Hill and I went to school in at Maris Brothers, Parramatta, which is mm. across the road from Westmead Hospital. Yeah. Um, yeah, and just just knowing the area is what obviously kept us there, but investing, like in it, going back to my um, grandfather and uncles in the business, they were always Western Sydney. They believed in Western Sydney. They knew, they knew the area. Uh, and yeah, again, growing up, it was, in, it was instilled in us. So we, yeah, I mean, they, they stick to what you know as well. So it's not that we don't go out to other areas, but we know what we can develop for. We know what we can build for. We know the sites. We know, so we just stuck to our stronger point was Western Sydney where, um, yeah, where we knew we knew what we were doing. So Yep, yep. So yeah. growing up in, in Western Sydney, you went yep. to school there. Did you actually also finish high school around the area and then go on to further education? Yeah, so again, yeah, so Maris Brothers, Parramatta from year seven all the way to year 12, um, then after after school, it's interesting. I uh, to give you a bit more of a background, I went on site as soon as a construction site as soon as I finished school, expecting it just to go through the flow because that's what my brother did as well. So I was expecting, you know, I'll go on site, go through the go through the ranks, go through the steps. Um, but it was probably about a, six to eight weeks into construction, I didn't actually like the construction side of it. So I was always into sport when I was younger. That was yeah. uh, like from soccer, footy, tennis. I played everything. Um, so uh, eight weeks in, I went up to, went to my mum first, being a bit of a mummy's boy, break the news <laughs> to her. Yeah. You know, I was a bit scared to tell dad I didn't like construction. Yeah. So yeah. I went to mum and said, I don't actually like construction. You know, what, do I, what am I going to do? How do I tell dad? And she's like, no, just tell him, be open. He, we're not going to force you to do what you don't want to. We want you to be happy in life. We want you to be successful. But at the same time, you need to be happy, which is the most important thing. So I actually stepped away from construction and property and went on to do sports management. Ah, oh, interesting. Which is, okay. yeah, which is a player agent. So I was like managing football players, soccer players, basketball players. I had my accreditation with the NRL. Um, so I did that for about a year. But I mean, stepping away from that then allowed me to realize what I did have in the, in the construction industry and in the property industry. So, I mean, I took some stuff away from it. It was good. It was a good learning experience, but again, without the support of my parents here, yeah, I wouldn't be in that position now where they let me step away and see what I had. So yeah, that's a bit more of a bit of a background on myself where wow. sport has always been involved. Yeah. Fantastic. It still is today. It, it is. And I can definitely yeah. see that that's where the passion, yeah. obviously you're, yeah. you're committed to training, you know, in the gym yes. every morning. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. sports yeah. is a key morning, vital right. important of your life. Well, it's good break. You can't, yeah, you need to, you need to break away. Yeah, totally. So nice. just to understand a little bit about that, I guess construction being on site, you're moving around a lot. And um, yeah. I guess if you're out and about doing sort of less office kind of thing, how does that tie back into, I guess, your, your sports in passion? Cause you took a, a year off to be able, or not a year, but you went away for a year to be yeah. able to focus on doing something that you're passionate about, what changed to bring you back after that one year? I just, I thought, I thought what the sports, the sports industry, I thought uh, it was different to what I thought it would, would have been. I thought it would be um, all the glitz and glamour of sports and celebrities and getting involved in the team. But I just didn't have that, didn't have the passion that I thought. Like I gave it time. I had a lot of like work experience with other agents and I just didn't have that. Like I was good at the start when you're learning something new, but then I, probably about six months in, I just thought, you know what, this is not, it's not what I thought it would be. I'm um, not because I wanted to get straight to the top and be the number one agent. It was just, I just saw the nitty gritty of it all, the behind the scenes. It just wasn't, it, it, was, it wasn't a passion. Like I didn't have the passion that I thought I would have had. So, and again, that then obviously allowed me to take a step back and say, okay, I had it good. Like, you know, I've been blessed with what my family has uh, helped me set up and what they've set up for me. So it was okay, look, let me just have another shot at it. And that's when my dad pulled me in and said, okay, you don't like construction, it's fine. Let's look at the business side of it. 
and that's when he started getting me involved with um, dealing with real estate agents and dealing with planning. And, and then I read that, that's when I really loved that. I saw that I saw, yeah, the, um, I saw the potential there and yeah, it just went from there. So, but I mean, it's good. I mean, what I learned in sport management allowed me to bring some, um, some of the, those key attributes to the property industry, which is all the teamwork and working together. Um, yeah. So it, it was good. I mean, it's, it did, I didn't like it. It wasn't the future, but to say, I didn't learn anything from it would, wouldn't be right. I did learn a lot from there and um, yeah, allow me to appreciate uh, what I do have a lot Wonderful. more. I guess. Yeah. Wonderful. I'd love to be able to just understand at what age, if you recall that you actually went on site, did you actually growing up during high school, go out on development sites and, you know, follow your, follow your parents and yeah. do business here? Yeah, yeah, on holidays. Uh, so when I like, term holidays, the two-week holiday breaks, some um, dad would wake me up at 6 a.m. or wake up with my brother at 6 a.m. Yeah, there's no holidays. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but I wanted to do it. Yeah, I wanted to do it. It wasn't about they wake me up and drag me out of bed. Like say, it wasn't forced. It was, I wanted to do it. I wanted to learn. I mean, yeah, growing up early on, I mean, from when I was six or seven or eight, when I could start understanding things a bit better, like we'd have a family barbecue with all our cousins and relatives. And the talk was construction. The talk was property. So without realizing it, you were learning, you were picking up on things as well. So yeah, and it just gradually built. And a lot of people in my uh in my year at school a lot of their families are involved in property so without yeah so it's all it's all um it was there without physically really focusing on it like you just heard it in the background so you learn and learn um but yeah no it from a young age i i've been involved in it and yeah i knew there was always going to be some kind of um future there for fantastic. me fantastic and and tell us a little bit about your parents um yep. mom and dad are very very nurturing very caring supportive and they really really helped you all the way yeah. through so I guess if you want to talk a little bit about, I guess your parents, they've obviously been in, in property development. What kind of like developments were they initially in or have they always been in? Uh, always been in property. A property has been their number one um, investment uh, vehicle, you could say. Um, but over the years, we've, my father's kind of gradually started getting into different kind of businesses too. Um, he realized that property um, is now for me and my brother. So he's kind of now started to a bit more through medical, through finance. He's getting into a bit more businesses. Um, but yeah, they, they, like you said, they've been nurturing. They've been great. They've um, allowed us to do what we want to do. It's always, it's not a yes or no. It's come to me. Let's talk, you know, let's, let's work out a way. So they've been great. Um, they'll always be in property. I mean, they've got, yeah, got a lot of properties. So mum's always been, mum's involved in the business, but obviously not as much as, as dad um but she's part of it she's in the office daily um but yeah she's more the the mother the go-to when you you need an issue and there's a problem so <laughs> she's like the, she's the office mom we call her here so she looks after everyone's that's amazing everyone's i mean to, to have yeah. mom around to help and especially when she's had yeah. that much knowledge over the yeah. many many years that you know being with your father and so forth and then yeah. to be able to support you all the exactly. way through your own business yeah. that yeah. is just phenomenal so yeah it's been great no no, no. we don't have any other way yeah very blessed very blessed. Fantastic. And what I also love to just understand a little bit about is, um, I guess, the, the property development side, because there's so many aspects of it. You can go into unit development, townhouses, housing. What aspect did you, I guess, as you and your brother and your mum went into the business, what aspect did you decide to target on? Uh, well, yeah, going in, our the company was always in uh, apartment development. So, again, we were naturally in that state from the start. It was apartments. Uh, we did some a lot of townhouse developments, but yeah, I mean that the apartment development was a strong point at the start, um, and that what that's what got me into it. Seeing the developments, I was doing, just seeing it come alive. From you'd be you'd go to, uh, on the way to school, I'd be driving past our development sites, and I'd see the apartments going up. And from our school, we were building one behind us. So when I was in class, people were saying, "Oh, that's your development." That it, it gave you like proud. You were proud. Yeah. You know what I mean. So seeing stuff go like that, people saying, oh, your family's doing well, your company's doing well, it, it inspired me to want to keep doing it and keep that tradition going. So apartment development is always the best. But now with the new group, my brother and I, we want to create more communities. You know, we want to give that retail mix. We want to give that vibe to each development. When you walk into an Ellison development, you want to know, you'll know it's an Ellison development, good retail mix, good, like, good living um, yeah, so that's why. So we still will always be apartments. It's what we know. It's what we've been doing for over 50 years, what the family has been doing. So I think that is our strong point. 
and we'll, we'll keep doing that. But yeah, it, it was always apartments. Uh, not to say we won't do anything else, but apartments will be our strong points. We've developed commercial buildings in the past. We've done our townhouses. We've done retail shops. We've done shopping centers, but we just always, um, 90% will always be apartments. apartments. Excellent. And on the scale of the apartments, like how many apartments do you usually look at doing on average? Uh, so I've always got about, always under construction or managing through our construction companies. There's always about 2000 apartments under construction at any given one time. In the planning, there could be up to, I mean, there's some of the big developments, like we've got one up at, out in Leppington, which is uh, earmarked for about 15,000 apartments in a 18 in an 80,000 square meter shopping center. So obviously that's not being built overnight. That's a 10 to 15 year project, which will be built over time. Um, then there's bigger ones in, Sco uh, so not bigger. There's one in Schofield, which is 4,000 apartments, one in Parkley, 5,000. So we're really, we're long-term. Where you know where we're here to stay, we're developing, we're working with local communities, working with local councils to get the best development. So, we're, like I said, we're proud of what we develop. We're not yeah here today, gone tomorrow. We stand behind our products and uh, yeah. So they're the kind of developments that we're doing. We're creating communities, creating um, um, yeah, creating mini suburbs, you could say. Yeah. So yeah, and we really um, really enjoy doing that. It's not just putting up apartments and hopefully leasing the shops later. We're getting that retail mix right from the start. We're engaging retail architects, retail agents to get that input, to make it sure it's a viable, viable development. So, yeah. yeah. And these are not small scale developments. Like you're not, we're not talking about yeah. 10, 20 mm. apartments. We're talking about thousands, thousands here. So therefore you are talking about a, definitely yeah. a community. You're bringing in yeah. the whole, I guess, basically suburb almost in, in yeah. any sense when you think yeah. about it. Yeah. Where, where do we find this type of demand? Because we're talking, you know, as you said, 15,000 units down at, at uh, down south and then you've got, you know, a few thousand yeah. up in Schofields and stuff. Where is that demand coming from? It's obviously COVID has put a pause on immigration, but before that, there was a huge drive. We saw, I mean, everyone could see that Australia was, Australia is the safe haven. Everyone's coming to Australia, whether it's investing or wanting to move. So I think the demand is there from overseas and um, once the tourism picks up again, but I think, like I said, our developments are not two-year projects. They're 15-year projects. They're 10-year projects. So we do know that uh, the immigration is going to pick up again. The borders are going to eventually open. It's not going to be closed for a while. Um, and, yeah, I think so. That that is where it's immigration. Um, and we're still seeing a large number of um, locals here who are still buying for family members overseas. So um, mums and dads are buying property here for their future, for their kids to come out in the future and still study. So study and education is a big part. I mean, Australia's got the best education in the world. So you've got your background, like your Chinese, your Indian, they're all buying here to, for their, yeah, for their, for their kids' futures. So between immigration, education and growth, I think those three cover us over the next uh, 10 to 15 years, I would say. Mm. And that's really interesting because we're looking at long-term, like, you yeah. know, usually smaller developments take anywhere between say, Oh, 12 to 24 months yeah. and basically you're in and out and you got your cash and so yeah. forth but you're looking at like five ten years how yeah. do you actually sustain a business for that period of time because cash flow is going to be key yeah. um it's a very interesting question here yeah. because i think a lot of developers out there get to the point where they go, okay i'm in it for two years three years i actually know a few developers have been in their projects for four or five years mm. and you know the, the funding part is always the, the biggest yeah. um part and yeah. you know of it. how do you actually fund yourselves for that period of time uh, so when I say a 15,000 or 4,000 unit development, it's not getting the money for the 15,000 units up front. You stage it with the funder. You stage it with the um, whoever your financier is at the time. So yes, it's a 15,000 unit development, but they'll look at it 500 units at a time and you'll deliver it in stages. So they're going to fund you for the first 500. They roll that money into the next stage and the next stage and the next stage. But at the same time, we've got a pool of assets. We've got commercial buildings, we've got retail assets, we've got um, hotels, a hospitality business where we keep we keep funding through that as well. So there is there is a lot of cash flow, but cash flow is king. You need a lot of, you obviously need your cash flow to keep businesses going. But at the same time, yeah, the construction arm is run through, the construction development arm of a development is run through our financier team, but they look, they, they forecast. So they look at it in stages and we've got heads of finance. We've got a finance director who's X, A, and Z. So he understands the whole process and he's got the contacts in the industry. So they will continue to, um, they continue to work with the funders. And we like to only work with a minimal amount of financiers. So once you've delivered one job or two or three jobs, they trust you, the trust is there and you just keep 
repeat business. You know, they know you're going to deliver. So there's no, the risk is a lot more minimal. So mm. a key to that would be proving yourself in the first couple. And then, yeah, yeah they'll, they'll naturally just come back to you and want to do more and more. Fantastic. Yeah, that's always been the challenge, I guess, with yeah. any development, because I think at the end of the day, when people are actually buying property just to invest, they hold on to it and you've yeah. got your stable cash flow from rentals. But with mm. these ones, as you said, until you actually deliver on it and obviously that's with right. pre-sales yeah. and so forth, mm. that's when you keep Yeah, yeah of course, pre-sales, I think, yeah. But I mean, even the pre-sales now, there's a lot of build to rent that's happening now. So oh. financiers, uh, financiers are good. They're, they're, they're they're more they're business minded like your traditional banks when you used to do with the Westpac's ANZ it was it had to be 110 percent debt coverage which in this market it just never get off the ground so financiers now have understood the market's changing and they're doing a lot more build to rent um, developments which we're also uh, doing a few of them too so it's educating them as much as it is just asking for money you got to take them through it uh, yeah so it's good it's it's good I now have I mean the last maybe four or five years got more involved in the finance side allowed me to travel a lot more to Hong Kong, to India, to Dubai, to look at all these funds and see what people are looking for. Uh, so it's been good. It's been good. And I think it's there. They're willing to change. They're willing to adapt. So whatever the market is, this financier will change or you'd use a different financier for a different project just to keep it, uh, keep it flowing. Yeah. Two things I just probably want to ask, especially for the listeners that probably might be quite, I guess, green to this is, um, Build to rent, if we could talk a little bit about that. And then secondly, yep. about financiers, you know, is that a private lending institution? So let's talk a little bit about build to rent. I'm probably yep. wanting to expand on that a little bit more in, in terms of how it actually is impacting. Oh, yeah. Yep. I mean, it's been the talk of the town for the last year or two, but there was no incentives. <clears throat> there was no real incentives for developers to do it. So, but now recently the government has come in with a 50% land tax reduction if you do build to rent um, so they're starting to realize it's more and more but in short build to rent is like you build obviously build it and you can only rent it and you've got to rent it for a certain amount of period there's got to be an on-site manager there's got to be amenities for the community so like a community center or a, um, somewhere to somewhere for the residents to meet uh, it's good it's again it's another development it's another part of the business where it can assist you with cash flow uh, financiers like it once there's so basically you'd you do a development site, you'd, be, you'd rent it out and then you'd refinance it and that's how financier um, moves out. Or a financier has two different arms where they have a construction loan and they have a um, long-term hold asset loan. So they'll do the both. So they'll another pool will refinance it and just keep the um, money turning there. So you pay them interest or whatnot. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of people doing it now. Um, and it's another, it's another good thing for people who obviously affordability is an issue in Sydney for a yeah, lot of yeah. people. So rental is there any, is there any option? Uh, and yeah, you'll, you'll see a lot more coming, coming up and we'll, yeah, we'll continue to, to do some, but it's good. I mean, you can still own an asset and you can rent at the same time. So I think a lot of people are doing that now. That's great. So just to clarify and understand, yep. you would be building the, as a developer, building the yep. apartments and then also, too, you'd be private, uh, property managing them as well exactly, too, because yes. you're renting out to tenants as well. That's right. So therefore, yes. you literally have to set up an arm to, to run that. The property management. Yeah, so we've got a property manager in here as well who will be doing that. But again, it allows us to then either go to the local real estate agent or run it with us depending on how big it is or or whatnot. But yeah, we've got a property manager in-house who, who runs that whole thing. But yeah, you're right. It's another arm. You're basically setting up the business to purely look after that. So yeah. it's a mini hotel service department kind of development I mean, it's very smart it's like you're almost like you, you got your big chunks of cash coming in from the sales yeah. of the properties and then you also got your rental arm which is your long-term exactly yeah and that's what going back flow. to what i said cash flow is and that'll be the cash flow that can help the business running which every business needs so yeah, uh, yeah. i mean i've heard a few developers they say you know build build some keep some sell some you know <laughs> yeah, yeah we used to do like so we'd, we'd sell some in the development and then we'd like keep some like 10 or 20 in the development but now we've actually said no let's do a proper build to rent developments where it's pure rent. Um, yeah, so I think in the next three years, we've, we've earmarked about 2,000 apartments to do as wow. built to rent. So That's a no, nice cash flow yeah. to have. And it allow, yeah, and it, it, allows, it allows the buyer, it allows uh, options as well. You're not just the developer who sells. You know, people are, there's a lot lot more people who want to rent. So yeah. there is the market for it. And it, yeah, it gives us the, allows us to give um, op, uh, options for both, for both people, all Fantastic. people. And then talking about financiers, you're talking about going overseas to get uh, funding and so forth. Are we talking about like private funding here? We're not talking about going to a bank institution overseas, are we? 
Uh, no, private funds. Yeah, so private yeah. funds overseas that yeah, manage uh, whether it's a super fund or private fund. Yeah, but it's it's funds over from overseas. Whether it's um, yeah, it could be anywhere. Like we're dealing with the head of the H H fund um, where they get the, they say it's a uh, private money as well. So the 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 fund manages it for these private um, high net worth individuals, and they, yeah, they and they. Um, yeah, comes through us, and yeah, that's no, good. It's private funding, in short, is what it is. Yeah, yeah. it's just, it's really interesting because I'm wondering what is the I guess attraction to coming over here because obviously there's so many different opportunities all around the world, yep. and then they they choose Australia. What what have you experienced to be the reasons why they like to come out to Australia and invest the money here? Just the stability in government. Uh, government stability is a big one. We're very like touch wood. Never war. There's never I mean, there's contra- never controversy or major things that shake up the government. And Australia's still young. They can see the growth and the potential. Uh, it's 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 distant from everyone, so it never gets caught up in all the European issues or the American issues. We're far away. We're safe. We're young, and you can the way we not the way we sell it, but we know it. And obviously having the experience in it, if you guys have been there for 50 years with all your experience, we know what you're doing. We know something's working, something's going right. So we know Western Sydney is our strong point. So we we can sell that well. We can tell them we're deli- what we're delivering, how we're delivering it, the return. And again, it's you can, you can say it as much, but you need to show it as well. So we've obviously... Um, We've developed, we've delivered in the past and with these funders. But I think going back to your question is it's it's the, it's the safety of the country and the potential growth. We're such a big country with a small population of 25 million, but that will continue to grow. People are continuing to come over and they know that there is, there is um, money to be made for their businesses, but the growth, potential growth is what is what the key is, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the, the thing about Australia. We've always had that stable growth yeah, for that many that, years. I mean, exactly. every 10 years, we've seen our properties double and it has yeah. just proven. It's, it's yeah. amazing how it does, yeah. but in other countries yeah. don't seem to have those exactly. kind of exactly. stability. So it's, it's amazing 100%. to see that. Actually, I wanted to take a step back as well and ask a little bit about your company name because that was very unique. I, I yep. really, really resonated with that. How did you and your brother and, and your team all yep. come up with that name? So Ellison comes from, it's a combination of two words. Uh, the A double L is from a street we were grew up in or my first house in Marylands in Western Sydney. So it was Ellis Street, Marylands. So I was there for the first five or six years of my life. My brother was there probably for the first 10 years of his life before we moved to Constitution Hill. But that A double L comes from Ellis. And the second part of Ellison, which is the E-R-S-O-N, is from Anderson Street in Parramatta, which was my brother and I's first project together. So we combined the two where we first grew up and our first project and became Ellison. So E-double L. Wonderful. So, That's yeah. a perfect, perfect leading because I was, yeah. was going to ask you and talk a lot about your first development because this is yeah. the one that most people remember. Like It's usually yeah. the first investment, first development. That's yeah. the most memorable. Talk a little bit about that. So yeah, the first development of me and my brothers, the new company is in Anderson Street, Parramatta. It's a 23 story, 173 apartment development, which is a build to rent. So we're looking at, which oh, that's why it also holds a lot of um, uh, sentimental value to us because we're going to hold it, we're going to build it, we're going to rent it. And it's going to be our first, it'll always be come back to being our first development together. Uh, so that's the one, yeah, it's always going to have that bit of a special feeling. Uh, ground floor retail on the park in the Parramatta CBD and something we'll always, we'll always, yeah, um, always uh, cherish, I guess, yeah. and have that special feeling, yep. Yeah. yeah. Nice. And how did you, how did you and your brother find that first development site? Uh, again, luckily through uh, local, knowing local agents, we've had that site for a while. So we have bought it probably, over 10 years ago, I'd say. Um, but this was before Parramatta boomed. Uh, so we actually had a DA approval on it for a six story, 50 unit development. Uh, but when Parramatta was changing, there was a growth. We took the opportunity and we decided to rezone the site, which is obviously uplifting and changing LEPs. Uh, got it to a 23 story tower, um, increased the unit number and yeah, just through, through local through a local through a local agent and building that reputation in the industry, knowing all the agents, you know, they come to us, they know what we're gonna if that we are capable of settling and delivering. So yeah, it was just a simple, it wasn't yeah, nothing, nothing out of the ordinary acquisition. It was just a normal clean acquisition and 
yeah, ended yeah. up being one that we one that we kept and one that we're gonna yeah always have a special special place for us. Absolutely. So ten years ago, you purchased it, you had a DA approve on it for fifty yep. units, and then yep. with the change in that, how did you go through that process? Because you know, to to I guess have that change. Was it something that the council said, guys, you can build more? Or did you just approach council and recommend that, look, because of the changing yeah. scope? So it was actually our, our town planner who was our consultant on the job. He said, it was their approval about to start construction. And he said, guys, there's a lot happening in Parramatta. Um, as you know, I think this key, I think this site has the ability to have more uplift. It was on the park, so the design had to be specially designed. So it's actually like a step building, it steps down. Uh, so there's no overshadowing on the park. So... Our planner told us, we went to council, we said, would this be something that you would support a rezoning through? They said, yes, definitely. We're all for it. Um, give it, yeah, take it into account, overshadowing of the park and surrounding uh, properties. But from there, uh, it started. We went through a design competition. We got the rezoning done first. So we rezoned that to 23 stories, six to one FSR. Um, and then went into a design competition. So three local architects um, all put their submissions in and went went through that and the winning architect was a group out in the eastern suburbs alexander design group um yeah and now the building's under construction it's up to about level nine i think today for level 23 and yeah moving forward so yeah like you can see that if you buy a site today it doesn't mean you're going to build it tomorrow so we bought it 10 years ago and we're now it's under construction so people would say well, what's taking so long why is this move the site not moving but in the background you see how much work goes into it it's not about like you said earlier, there's so many aspects of the property, the property life. It's it's not just by the site, build tomorrow. There's planning, dealing with council, dealing with local government, co design competitions. A rezoning process takes two years. So then a DA takes another year. Then a design yeah. competition. Then there's pre-sales. Obviously not for this one because the build to rent, but a lot goes into that that um, early stages of the development. And yeah, I mean, yeah, that 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 was the process. So earmarked by our planner went to council, got their support, and then we started the process. So, yeah, and that, that's another thing. Getting the right consultants is a big, big, big part of our development, a big part of our success. They know in the areas, they know what we build and what we deliver. So, yeah. That's that's phenomenal just to be able to hear that. And, and that makes all sense because, you know, even just when you think about 10 years, even though it's it sounds like a very long time, the amount of work that goes involved, and I, I've dealt with councils as well, and just even just getting it one day. They can be tough, though. Yeah, they, they can be tough, those guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, let, let's take a step back, and I, I would yep. love to find out a little bit more about this journey. So you've been with one property, and that's the first property there with Anderson. Yep. How many sites would you say you've uh, currently on your books at the moment and, and gone through? So in planning or in planning, planning yeah, planning we'd have in terms of sites, probably 25, rough part, 25 in planning. Um, there's some that are DA approved, some in the rezoning. Uh, and then in construction, there's 2,000 probably under construction with about probably another yeah, 2,000 every year. So it's always turning, it's turning, turning through them. Um, 25 in planning. And then we're always constantly looking for new new sites. Um, but the whole the, we always we now what we try to do is always have five or six big sites under construction um, to the 400, the 500 units. Rather than we found that in the past, you use the same amount of resources on a 500 block of units than you would on a, than you do on a 20 block of units. So it just wasn't making sense continuing doing these 20 block of units. So we said let's let's cut it back instead of doing 50 20 units. Let's do four or five, 500 unit developments. And um, yeah, so we're just cleaning up all that. But to take you through it, there's a planning stage, there's a CC stage and there's a construction stage. So 25 projects probably in planning. There'd be always about seven or eight in CC and about five under construction. And it's just the machine. It just keeps, when one finishes, another starts, another gets acquired, another gets approved. So the machine just keeps keeps churning them out. And we've got the right team. Yeah. And you mentioned CC. What does that mean for listeners out there? Uh, CC is the construction certificate. So once you get a DA approval, it's not DA approved, start tomorrow. You've got to go through your CC, get your construction drawings ready for the boys on site. Uh, yeah. And then so that, that's that's DA, CC, then construction. And usually how long does the CC period take? For, for uh, it could, like again, yours? depending on, yeah, depending on the size, it could take anywhere up to probably two to three months to get a mm. CC proper done, ready to go for construction purposes. So that's your civil drawings, that's your structural drawings, where your DA is more just your layout and your your building design. 
But once you get your DA approval, then the, the nitty gritty design of yeah, steel beams, uh, Rio, all this kind of stuff needs to get in, get involved. And that's that's the CC stage, which which is what the builders build off the CC plans, not the DA plans. Yeah. yeah. Wow. There's so much that goes on and, and it's, yeah, it's amazing lot, to, to yeah. be able to hear, you know, you've obviously got to have extremely, extremely good systems. You've got to have an extremely good team to be able to do yeah. that because there's no way you can manage that many projects or yourself, yeah. obviously. Yeah. So you, you've done quite a lot actually in, in a very short period of time. I mean, you're still yeah. early 30. So yeah. congrats. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. But yeah, but like you said, it's the support, it's the support of the team without, you know, without having like me and my brother, yes, we're owners and co-founders, but Without the team, without the heads of each department, like you wouldn't, you wouldn't, um, wouldn't be where we are. I always like to refer to the reference of again going back to sport. LeBron James is a big idol of mine, and he's the greatest of all time in my eyes. And some yes. people say Jordan, some people say LeBron. I'm a LeBron man, so yeah, me too. he's the best today. But he still needs help. You know what I mean? Like he can't do everything on his own. He went out and got Anthony Davis from it, and they came together and they won a championship. So. I use that a lot in, in the business world. I mean, you can be the best, but if you don't have the right teammates around you, it's, you're not going to win anything. So I like to always refer back to that, to the staff as well. I like to yeah. refer that. Yeah. So, so yeah, again, that's their smart. Um, that's how you run a business. They're the heads of each department. Absolutely. Example. I think that that's fantastic to be able to know because it's so important, you know, people around you, the team around you is, is what helps you with your success. Yep. And I actually wanted to, understand a little bit you've gone through quite a lot of great developments and you've got a lot under your books at the moment and i'm pretty sure that it's not smooth sailing all the way you know if, if life was that then everybody would be jumping into yeah. property development yeah of course share with us perhaps maybe a really interesting story maybe about one of the worst things that's happened during this time let's hope it hasn't been you know but mm. if you've got a story to share because i think it's more like a, a learning lesson for potentially yeah. developers um, out there in, I mean, getting a refusal, a DA a few, a refusal, sometimes a setback. It's like, what did I do wrong? How could I have done better? Um, so it always allows you to just continue. There's nothing wrong with, I wouldn't say failing, but not getting your where you were. We learn from it. Without without getting a DA refused or without getting a planning proposal refused, you're not going to know how to become better the next time. Um, in terms of development, there's maybe jumping the gun or timing has not has sometimes not been the best, the best um, reason. Like, I mean, we... One that we did sell was, I'll give you an example, actually. Yeah, I got a good one. Uh, it's a block of apartments that we did, about 300, block, 300 units. Um, we agreed on a price for every unit with the real estate agent. So it was a minimum price that he could sell for. Um, that was just us saying, yes, we just, let's just sell these things. We agreed on a price, say it was 500,000 a unit is what we want, whatever you get above that. You, good, good luck good luck to you this we're going 15 years ago before everything was as it is today um he's come around and he's the market boomed and the product started selling for 700 800 000. yeah so he ended up making more money than us on the site so i wouldn't say we still made money so it wasn't like it was a fail but it was more about controlling every aspect of each business so from from planning all the way up to sales. It was just having that opportunity to, um, to learn, to control, not to just sign, yes, go. And it's, it's being involved in every little uh, single detail. So that would be a learning lesson where now, when it comes to real estate uh, and sales, we're really controlling it. We've got, a, we've got a sales manager here who will manage that. Never lock in prices. It's always able to move subject to the market. So that was one lesson where I learned that, okay, we need to, control our own sales, our own sales department. Um, yeah, that, that would be a, that's a big, that's a big moment that every time I drive past that development now, I'm like, damn, it looks good. It's good. It's a great, great development. But yeah, so something like that is, and that comes back to, yeah, being involved now in every aspect of the business, not running it so much and telling them what to do, but just making sure you're across everything to make sure each department, the engine is running smoothly and well oiled. Mm. Talking about actually understanding and running, you know, like how many departments would you say you've currently got in your business at the moment? Uh, so we've got acquisition and planning, uh, sales, marketing, uh, development management, property management, accounts. So probably six or seven. And then they all, and then there's obviously the construction arm, which runs itself. But in the development arm under Ellison Property, um, I'd say seven, seven, yeah. eight, eight with the finance as well too. So eight departments. 
So that, that's quite a lot of departments. I mean, yeah. it's no small feat. How do you actually help manage the team without, as you said, being in control? Like, how do you ensure that things actually, I guess, uh, met to targets, ensure that things are running smoothly yeah. in order so, to- So, uh, yeah, uh, again, open office here. So everyone walks around, they're talking to each other. It's not, oh, you can't come into my office, but fortnightly meetings, we've got WhatsApp groups with each team. We're throwing ideas around at each other. So we have fortnightly meetings, but within that fortnight, you can't wait two weeks to make a decision in this industry. So we're in a WhatsApp group. Everyone will text, "What can I do this? Can I do that? My sales manager will say, I've got an offer of this, but they can only pay this. Yes. So rather than wait two weeks, you're going to lose a sale. So it's just allowing people to have that freedom, but um, communication is key. And that's how we get, stay on top of it. Just, um, yeah, meeting, meeting regularly, but talking regularly as well. So yeah, so and allow, allowing them to yeah, then after, yeah, communication. But then after a while, they kind of know what our answer is going to be just by speaking to us a lot more. Like they know where we're thinking and yeah, just catching up regularly allows them to understand us more and yeah, give them that freedom to. I actually say sometimes um, they come to me and they'll say, oh, this unit's 800,000. The guy can only offer 750. I'll say go away in a good way and say, you, you sort of like knowing like giving them the opportunity to no, show me what you are uh, giving them their responsibility. So yep. to say, I'd say, you go do it. Um, what do you think? You know what I mean? So what do you think? What do you think we should do rather than them just coming to me, asking questions and me giving answers. I want to, we try to encourage them to be you know, stronger, make their own decisions. So yeah, that's, that's, that's a way to control it, but at the same time, give them a bit of freedom and yeah. Yeah. So basically delegating their responsibility that they know their role. Yeah, so that they can go at you know achieve exactly. Yeah, the yeah, best yeah, thing yeah, they can yeah, do. yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah. right. And again, you, I mean, you're gonna, you're not, not every decision is right. You're never gonna make a, every decision not always gonna be right in life. So it's more about learning from it as well. If something did go wrong, totally. So you've achieved quite a lot, and uh, you've shared. And thank you for sharing that that really, really good learning lesson there. I think yep. it's really important because yeah, <laughs> if you, if yeah. you <laughs> miss out on that extra profit, oh, which yeah, it can yeah, be yeah. quite painful. It's up to your cost. Yeah, uh, so talking about that, actually, some of the successes of your business. Perhaps let me share with us one case study that you, you've been really proud of. What's been one of the most successful, say, projects that you've achieved? Um, one of the successful ones we've achieved, I would say. A one in I'm trying to think where would be the one that would stick out most. I think the reason like it's not one that hasn't been developed yet. It's more about one where we purchased an industrial site um, that no one else would have touched. No one else touched it. No one said no, 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 I'm not developing this. It's all it's industrial. There's no chance of it getting rezoned to residential. So we picked it up cheap, got the rezoning through, and it's now it can be built for 1500 apartments. So something like that is that that's what I love getting it. That's, that's my achievement because I was obviously the property and acquisition. So backing yourself um, and believing in yourself, knowing that something that everyone doubted, everyone doubted, not doubted me personally, doubted the site in general, but backing myself to have the belief that I could get this done. Um, so that was a, that was early on in my career as well. So that was one where I said, you know what? I mean, I can, you know, I felt like Superman after that, when that got approved. So <laughs> I thought nothing can stop us. There's been other learning lessons. I mean, it's just going on lessons. It's, I mean, another development earlier on where I think it was my first VA that I did for my old man. He, it was a 36 story tower, 400 units and got it approved. I was so proud of it. And then he, Next day, not next day, I mean, it got approved and a few weeks later, maybe a month or two later, he said, we're selling this site. I was like, what do you mean? I'm like, you don't sell sites, we build, we deliver. He's like, I've got a good offer, I'm selling it. Um, yeah, and we can move on and go get a few more sites. I'm like, I put a year into this, all my hard work, it was my first DA, my little baby, and he flicked it. And he, after he sold it, like all along, I'm like, please don't sell it, it's mine, please don't sell it, please, like as in. And then he pulled me aside after that and he goes, look, this is a lesson for you in life. You develop with your develop and go through business with your head, not your heart. Your heart will lead you to family and love. Not to say don't use your heart, but when it comes to business, head first and then your heart. So, and since that day, it's just, I've never fallen in love with another developer. Not to say we don't love our developments, but it's when you're doing business, it's put your head, head on first. Because if you go with your heart, it's gonna, 
you're going to waste time. You're going to get too involved. You're not going to let it run smoothly as a business person. So that's a lesson. So from getting that thing when people doubted the site to learning a lesson through my dad where he said, yeah, don't fall in love with developments. So a couple of lessons for me. That's awesome. That sounds like the perfect aha moment too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That is that is the aha moment. That, that all clicked then. A lot clicked then from, yeah, from having the belief, from that rezoning, and then to the aha moment was, yeah, don't fall in love with the site. Just get it approved and then deal with it later. So, yeah. yeah awesome. I, wow. I would love to have been just stand there observing that moment with your father and just yeah, learning no. from that. Oh, if you saw my face, I was, yeah, I didn't want to talk to him. I was not happy. <laughs> yeah good, wow. good. it sounds like your, your father's a loving man but also a tough yeah. businessman as well yes. too you know that's you explain it that's the way perfect way you just explain it. he's i mean in his part he's donated millions to charities and back home in his country to lebanon over the years he yeah i mean a few million at least just whatever he gives he's always about he'll still know he'll go on site and he'll speak to every laborer every contractor like he'll he never forgets where he came from he came from nothing he came out here when he was 17 um had no money worked in a it's actually a funny story about it. he worked in a factory a plastic factory and only about four or five years ago he was driving past that same factory and it was for sale and he ended up buying it he bought the factory that he first worked in when he came out from lebanon so he's like that he lee he's and he's instilled it in us um he's such a genuine like he's always there he's just loving he's strong businessman though and he's tough he was tough and we were when we we're young, but a, a fair tough, you know, like he wasn't um, doing anything wrong, but he just, he could tell, like he was very, he pushed us in sport. He pushed us in work and school, wanted us to do well, but yeah, I mean, without him, obviously wouldn't be here, but he's, yeah, a strong, loving, caring businessman and a family man. Most family man. That's what I was going to yes, say. I can, yes. I, I can see the strong core family in, yeah. in everything we've talked about. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah that's been great. Cool. Well, um, I've gone a little bit emotional here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show him this. Let's show him how much I love him. <laughs> I've show him this. <laughs> if you ever questions me again, I say, look what I, look what I, I gave you a good rap, Dad. <laughs> yeah. right. Check that video out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, I think it leads perfectly into sort of the mindset side of things. We, yeah. It's been really amazing to be able to hear how the development, you know, has, has come about, you know, all your successes through that and, and the struggles and challenges, but also, you know, where you've learned all the aha moments. So yeah. I guess talking back about the developments and talking about the mindset, was there any, um, I guess, mentors besides, I mean, you talked about your father who yeah. seems like it was a very strong mentor for you, but were there any other mentors that you had during your whole journey that, you know, taught, taught you the things that you need to know about development? Um, my uncles as well. Uh, my uncles and my grandfather, they taught us not so much development, just business, just the business mindset. Um, yeah. So I think it would be them. They were involved in property too. So they helped us um, mature and become stronger. Um, yeah. So I'd say them. And from an outsider point of view, more, not so much, again, business minded people. So your, your Warren Buffett's, your Richard Branson's, they're, they're inspirational people. Um, coming from nothing, starting from nothing. And yeah, just reading and understanding how they operate. Uh, so they would be probably influencers and not yeah, someone so much a mentor, but an influence in, yeah, letting me do, I mean, business, whether it's property, whether it's selling cars, whether it's um, in medical finance, it's business, business has its structures and it's core, it's core, um, core strengths that you need. So yeah, I just, Reading a lot more about people, reading a lot of other businessmen helped me, um, yeah, help me know that anyone can do it. It can be achieved by anyone. Mm. So the, obviously these the great businessmen and also your uncles yeah. and so forth like that yeah. and, and your father and your family had yeah. quite a strong influence on you to be yeah. able to have that right mindset. Yeah. And, and you mentioned books as well. You read yeah. a lot. Were there any particular resource or books that you actually remember clearly that you could recommend to audiences that or listeners that they could potentially read. Yeah, definitely. Okay. One of my favorite would have to be shoe dog, uh, Phil Knight story, the CEO and founder of Nike. That, yeah. That's man. such a, uh, that book, I couldn't put it down. I think, I think I finished it in like three days. Like it was yeah. just so good. It was, you pick it up thinking it's about the Nike story, which it is, but you see it's a memoir by him written by himself as well. So you could see the passion and how much he actually meant to him, but just from everything from, from Nike, to his early journey traveling around the world getting knocked back by a certain amount of people um yeah it's just the whole the whole 
the whole book is just every page has a different twist and turn so it's like it's a made-up story like it was that good but it was actually yeah just seeing that is a and now look now seeing where he is to what he was and how yeah no one backed him no one believed in him people pulled out of him early on so yeah it, it was a, that's one of the books i definitely recommend for any not even a business person just anyone in general who's looking at yeah new like something to read uh, definitely shoe dog yeah oh, absolutely fantastic read yeah. i remember also too and um it was really fascinating because when you hear about phil's story when he was just a runner and you know his coach and stuff like went into business and stuff i, yeah. I was thinking that's kind of a, a disaster there because having your coach there yeah having those going to japan having those meetings yeah. with the yeah the tiger brand and all that yeah so uh, yeah it was good and he's living yeah running around living in different places every year but yeah the well, I mean, what he's turned out to be is unbelievable yeah, I mean, no one will ever forget the Nike brand. It's exactly now, you know, yeah. especially with the swoosh. It's such yeah, a simple exactly. concept. So simple, so simple. And um, I guess I'd also like to probably find out maybe one of the things that um, you've gone through over the years is what do you think has been the best advice that you've ever received? Uh, yeah, I think I what I said about that development. I think yeah, your head, not your heart. Work with your head. Yeah, this yeah, head over heart. Um, when it comes to, when it comes to business, um, that is so not not personal life. Heart, family is always personal. Um, but yeah, in terms of business and in terms of investing property, um, yeah, heart, don't fall in love with an investment property. That's just that's a that's a recipe for disaster. So yeah, um, going with your mind yeah, over your heart. Totally great. Let's take a step back and think about ten years ago. If you got a chance to meet yourself when you're ten years younger, what do you think you would have said to him? 10 years ago, um, speak up and don't be afraid to hold back. I was a lot more um, conservative and I, was, I held back a lot when I was younger, maybe because I was, I know I'm not sheltered a bit more, just a bit more, wasn't as confident. But ever since I started talking a bit more, uh, you learn a lot more. So a young Ramon would have said, speak up earlier. Um, or to told by young Ramon, speak up earlier. Don't be ashamed. Don't be scared to ask a question. I mean, you you may look stupid for a minute if you ask a question now, but you'll look even stupider in ten years if you didn't ask that question. So, just yeah, be be open and honest. If something's on your mind, talk it, let it out. And yeah, I think that that would that's what I would have told him. I would have said just yeah, don't be don't be afraid. Speak up, or the opportunity might pass. So. That's excellent advice. Mm. And, you know, obviously yeah. that's taken to where you are now. You know, if you didn't speak up or talk, especially yeah. you know, talking yeah. to agents, the council yeah. and stuff, you would yeah. not have ever had that exactly. opportunity to get those bigger exactly. deals. 100%, without a doubt. Excellent. Let's talk about Ford then. Uh, five years, we talked about, you know, the property developments that go on for like 10 years and 15 yeah. years and so forth. You, you guys are very big long-term planners and stuff like that. But what yeah. do you foresee Ellison property to look like in say five years time? In five years, I think we would have created quite a few communities. Like I said, well, that's what we're trying to achieve now. Um, a development where we can be proud of, a development agency that everyone knows about, um, the go-to property developer in Western Sydney, first and foremost. Uh, but yeah, in five years' time, I'd want us to not necessarily grow to thousands of staff. I think it's always better to keep it lean and agile. Um, so... I'd want it to be a well-known, well-respected brand that people are proud to say that they live in an Ellison apartment. Mm. Excellent. And what about for yourself personally? What do you see for yourself in five years' time? Um, hopefully, probably married, I'd say. So I'm still seeing, I've got a girlfriend. Um, so I'd say in five years' time, subject to COVID and traveling and all this, yeah, I'd, I'd say married with maybe two kids. I'd, I'll, put it, I'll put it at two for now. So married, two kids, uh, yeah, and just continuing here, getting better. Just always wanting to learn. I just always want to learn, get better, and um, yeah. Awesome, awesome. That's very exciting in five years' yeah. time. And I guess last question I want to find out from you, Ramon, is yeah. out of everything that you've done, you know, how much do you think of your success has been due to skill, intelligence, and hard work, and how much of it has been due to luck? Ooh. You need a combination of everything. I mean, again, yeah, I'd say majority is hard work. I mean, let, me, let me do a percentage wise. I'd say hard work would be 60%, intelligence 20, 
15 skill and five luck. That's 100, yeah? Yeah, that's 100, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think everyone needs luck. You need luck in everything, uh, whether it's timing, you know, when the property market's going to boom. So that's part of the luck, but nothing can stop hard work. I mean, if you're committed, if you're focused, um, the hard work will then help you become intelligent and skillful. So you can't become skillful and intelligent without working hard. So I think hard work is always the key. Um, and from a young age, like, yes, we were blessed to be born into the family of business, but my parents wouldn't have given me what we have if we didn't work hard. You know what I mean? Like I wasn't the smartest kid in school. I, was, I wasn't 90 in my HSCs and flying colors at every test. I wasn't smart at all. So I had to find another way to become uh, more of a businessman. And that was through hard work. It was, it was through working hard. It was through learning, being willing, willing, willing to learn, willing to listen, willing to understand. Yes, I came from a successful family, but it wasn't, I know everything, listen to me. It was someone who was, yeah, uh, anyone I'd listen to. I'd, I put myself on the same level as all my friends. There was never a time where I thought I'd better than anyone. So um, yeah, I'd say hard work and hard work, intelligence, skill, then luck. Wonderful. Actually, you touched on a very interesting key point out there. And we, we can look back at a lot of actually um, great successes from, you know, Bill Gates to Dell, you know, like Michael Dell and so forth. But a lot yeah. of them have all gone to school, you know, they've all been graduated and so forth, but they're not necessarily, you know, the best academically smart yeah. or street smart because they've, you know, got out there. And it sounds very, very similar in the sense, you know, because the thing is, is, I think the business world and the real world, you know, when you think about it, it's, it's yeah. the key is, is to be able to be not only street smart, but have a little bit of, of the right attitude. And I, I see that that's so important for a lot of the yeah. successful people is the attitude to be willing to learn, to change, yeah. to, to adapt. Exactly. And, yeah, that, yep. So I think that was just something that I think was a key point that I picked up from, from what you've said, because no, it yeah, doesn't, yeah. doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, you have to be the best at school. And I wasn't the brightest kid at school as yeah. well, but yeah. I think, you know, it's that willingness to learn, but the willingness to also work hard. So I really, really yeah. appreciate yeah. that. That's no fantastic. Worries, thank you. Anytime. All right. Well, Raymond, thank you so much for coming on to Property Investory Podcast. It's been a real pleasure to have you on. If people want to reach out to you, learn a little bit more about Ellison's development and, you know, what you do, what's the best way they can contact you? Uh, yeah, just through our uh, website, you can see what we're doing on our website, which is ellisonproperty.com.au. But even if people want to uh, shoot an email or you can do contact at ellisonproperty.com.au just to see what's going on, to get involved in our in our club. Um, or, I mean, even if people are thinking of joining or if they're in the property industry looking for a new opportunity, we're open to um, having interviews and meeting new people and, and, and growing the team, the right people. So we've got a hiring at ellisonproperty.com.au email. So there's different ways to get in contact with us, but all that information will be on our ellisonproperty.com.au website. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast today. It's been a pleasure to have you. And thank you again for sharing your amazing story. Cheers. Thanks, Tyrone. Appreciate it, mate.